There we go. All right, the staff and volunteers at the Bainbridge Island Historical Museum preserve our culture and connect us to our past. If you haven't been to the museum, please go. It's an amazing place, wonderful exhibits, lots of stuff going on down there, and you'll find out things about the island that you did not know, I guarantee it. It's open Wednesday to Sunday, 10 to 4 p.m., and it is free, our favorite price in the whole world. Okay, for the facilitator tonight, we have Katie Curtis. She's a community outreach manager at the Bainbridge Island Historical Museum. Katie's the driving force behind these panels. She reaches out in the community and gets people to come and talk with us. We pick the topics and uh, she's connected in the community. I learn lots about our island every time I work with Katie. I just think she's a wonderful, wonderful collaborator. Please welcome Katie Curtis. <laughs> John, you are just too kind. Thank you so much. This is um, wonderful and it's always wonderful be, to be doing this program with you and the library. We love our partnership with the library and I just have to shout out to you because you're on vacation and you're doing this program from where you're on vacation and it's just so great. It's always fun. And so uh, tonight we are very excited to have um, Bainbridge Black representing here and sharing um, the stories that, that are here to be sh shared by um, this group of, of friends and uh, we're going to listen to them and I will be answering, I mean I'll be helping with facilitating questions and so if you want to ask questions go ahead and put them in the chat. Who knows, we might just get casual enough so that you can pop in and, and have conversation. Um, I know questions are welcome. And before we get started any further, I want to acknowledge that we are on Suquamish territory. And so we're going to begin by acknowledging the land on which we gather is within the ancestral territory of the Suquamish people, expert fishermen, canoe builders, and basket weavers. The Suquamish have lived in harmony in, with the lands and waterways along the Salish Sea for thousands of years. Here, they live and protect the land and waters of their ancestors for future generations, as promised by the Point Elliott Treaty of 1855. And I always love to acknowledge um, that the, the, some of the, the spirit of the tribe of being very welcoming because our land is so abundant with um, food. And yes, we had some snow, but we never have a a lot of snow <laughs> and so it's a wonderful place to come and live and so thank you to the Suquamish people. Um, so let's kick off this party here tonight and um, I'm going to start I think by having our wonderful panelists introduce themselves and I think I'm going to start with Rennie. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Katie. I couldn't find my cursor. I couldn't see it. <laughs> All right, uh, my name is Rennie Bispum. Uh, I have been here on Bainbridge since uh, 2006. And um, I, I have uh, two boys uh, that have both uh, been through the Bainbridge Island School uh, system. My uh, youngest is currently a junior and my oldest is now a sophomore down in uh, college in San Diego. My wife, Brandy, is a teacher at uh, Woodward Middle School. Thank you for having me. Okay, I'll unmute myself and go next. Um, I'm Todd Baylor. I've been on or around Bainbridge for 15 years, 2005. So uh, I own Firefly Salon down on Madison and Winslow. And yeah, I enjoy doing community things. The fire department, theater. We'll see what's next. Bainbridge Black. <laughs> I can go next. I'm uh, Diana Scipio, and I am uh, the director of the graduate education program um, at Islandwood. Um, and my grads call me uh, Dr. Day, but y'all can call me Day if you'd like. 
Um, let's see. I first came to the island in uh, 2007 to go to the Islandwood program as a student. And then I came back in 2018 um, to direct the program. And um, this is a place very near and dear to my heart. Delighted to, to be here with y'all and talk a little bit about our organization. Good evening, my name is Darkeem Brown. I've lived here on the island going on about eight years now. I've got two kids in the Bainbridge uh, Island uh, School District. I've had one graduate from here. Uh, he's down in college in Louisiana. Uh, I was brought to you by way of the military. I'm still in, but I'll be retiring next month. And I greatly appreciate the opportunity to, to, to share with you this evening. Thank you. Hi, my name is Chastity Malatesta. On the island, I've been a, uh, let's see, going on five, six, yeah, COVID years. Um, I think it counts, it doubles the time that you've been here, but I've been a teacher on the island and an equity consultant, and I'm the co-chair of the Multicultural Advisory Council for Bainbridge Island School District. And I'm on a couple of boards, but most I get to hang out with these lovely people. Thank you for having me. So let's see, Rennie, would you want to start us off and tell us a little bit about this, the organization or the group? Sure, thank you. Um, so uh, in the middle of COVID, I think somewhere uh, in the summer of 2020, um, we uh, had just all been freed of the masks <laughs> for a brief, uh, short period. And uh, Chaz, Chazzy and I got together and, and you know, talked about um, you know, different ways to build community and be supportive. And um, as a result of that, we had a, uh, a group meeting. Our first meeting, I think, was at uh, uh, Bruschetta on uh, Winslow Way, um, where we basically just got together for a brunch and had a, a super great social time um, hanging with other Black folks uh, on the island and uh, finding out that there were more Black folks on the island than we typically see in our, our paths. They don't not usually cross. Um, so that was fun. And then as a result, that was the beginning. And uh, eventually, uh, we found more and more people, um, and we uh, weren't sure exactly what we were going to be as a group, um, but really we, we morphed and eventually uh, we decided that we would be more of a, uh, a social group. And so we, uh, we developed a, a mission statement like, who are we and what are we about? So um, I will, uh, uh, I don't know, I guess it's just about as good a time to share as within uh, what that is. So um, our mission that we've uh, landed on to date is uh, Bainbridge Black is a social group sharing the Black experience on Bainbridge Island, elevating Black joy and culture by providing a safe space for Black people to come together and be in community. Bainbridge Black is a celebration of Black excellence. And uh, that's who we decided that we want, want to be. Um, and, uh, as a result of that, we've grown from, I think the first time we met at Bruschetta, we were maybe six to eight of us. And at this point we're at uh, 17 or 18. Actually, we may even be at 20 now <laughs> after the last two editions. So uh, we've grown a little bit in, in the time, but uh, the, vision that I, the, the vision that I have for Bainbridge Black, and uh, I cannot say that I'm speaking for everyone, but my vision for Bainbridge Black is that it is a place where um, black folks can come and other people can come as well. Um, but we want to be able to um, enjoy social time together. We want to be able to support one another, um, share experiences, um, and, and be supportive uh, and encourage uh, each other to, uh, to do the excellent things that we already do. And um, as a result of that, um, we you know, have grown uh, to this at this point. Eventually down the road, uh, I see us having a place that we can call ours, where it is a community center um, that we not only uh, uh, socialize together and celebrate together, but we share the space with others um, and invite other people to come and do uh, hopefully social justice equity types of uh, workshop presentations and um, that sort of thing. So eventually I see us down the road as uh, being you know, a longstanding community uh, resource 
uh, not just for black folks, but really for uh, everyone on the island. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, Chastity, I, I was, I remember you saying that this is a group that is building from the inside. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. And, um, and I would love to get Darkeem and Todd and Deanna's on their why as well, because I think it's important, the um, interesting mix of the non-monolithic African-American is really important. Um, and I love the differences in the way that we see, but, but building it from the inside out is that many of us have elders or people in our family who have um, long worked um, to be black in spaces. And, and what I mean by that, they're, they're working in social justice, my elders and the people that I love, my grandmas and aunts and uncles. And um, the, the perpetuation that Bainbridge is this um, neighborhood or this bedroom community that's white was told to me when I brought my three young sons here. In fact, people would say, why are you moving to Bainbridge? It's super white or why would you go there? And what I realized was that it wasn't only um, white kind folks that were perpetuating this narrative. It was us black folks. We were saying, yeah, we live on Bainbridge, but, and it was discounting the whole entire history of the fact that there is an African-American footprint that's been on this island. And people like Akuye, Karen Vargas and Barbara Golden um, have been talking about this shared sense of history and this, um, and there are other um, black elder men too. I just don't remember their names tonight, y'all. Um, so who contributed to the understanding that, that this African footprint kept going back. And so we kind of kept perpetuating this and Bainbridge is becoming more multiracial all the time. We're looking at statistics right now that are like 21% of multi-ethnic. Many of us have um, white spouses or white partners. And so we had to start undoing and coming together and undoing this narrative within ourselves too. Um, and elevating black joy that the first thing you do when you go up to a, an African-American on Bainbridge Island isn't ask them about racism. Like we have other things we talk about. Um, we get lattes and we have joy and we dance and we're in theater and we're scholars and um, we play hockey. I mean, we play hockey. So like there are so many things that we do. And I think that that was not part of the discussions you'd see. African Americans in the newspaper, and there was either conflict or trauma. I mean, we we were the automatic doom, doom scroll. And so um, when we went to Rennie, we found lots of these other kindred spirits, people who didn't have kids and have dogs and want to go walk in the jungle, and people who are um, have way more style than I do, and 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 consider theater and arts and 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 gallivant around the world. So we wanted to come together and show that side of Bainbridge, but to do that we had to come together inside and get to know one another. Is that, is that about right? Am I, if I'm missing something, y'all correct me. Okay. Thanks, so what did you wanna hear from folks? Um, Darkeem, Todd and Deanna, they're wise. Before I share some pictures, I wanted, I just like listening to them anyway. <laughs> Uh, okay, I'll go first. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can tell you just listening to Rennie and uh, and Miss Chastity, uh, uh, they talked about uh, a little bit about uh, Bainbridge being uh, the, just thought of as a, as, a, as a place where Black people do not live in bulk or, or, or congregate. And uh, you know, I've, I've been a victim of that mentality myself when I first heard about uh, a Bainbridge Black, and uh, I went to uh, the first the first function I went to, I was in awe. I was just like, wow, there are so many of us here that I. I I'll be honest, I was surprised to see so many of us on the island, faces that I'd never seen. And you would think that, uh, you know, I would recognize folks from just being out in town and, and having, having, just having an opportunity to meet someone in such a small community. Uh, but I, I, it, was, uh, it was inspiring, it made me happy, and uh, I was thankful for the opportunity. As, as far as what it gives me, uh, again, because I use the word opportunity, it gives me an opportunity to interact with folks that I, I I feel very comfortable uh, with. We have a lot of the shared, ex same shared experiences, uh, same upbringings. I've had some funny laughs with uh, Miss Chassie and her husband about where they were born and raised. And uh, I'm sure that many folks in this room can share the same experiences, but uh, I, I, I can tell you that growing up in an inner city, at least to me, is a pretty unique experience uh, to go from there and, and now living on a house on Bainbridge and telling my kids stories about how I grew up. 
and them laughing at me and telling me that I'm exaggerating. So I, uh, I, I, I love the, I love the opportunity to speak uh, to the folks in the group and interact with them and socialize with them. Uh, it's, it's, it's in a very short time frame. It's almost become a second family, and uh, very comforting. I heard Chastity once uh, say uh, something to the effect of uh, the group breathing life into her. Or I'm paraphrasing. I can't remember exactly how she said it, but uh, for me, that's been my experience. Uh, I, I am a hermit by trade. I'm a military guy. I can be very rigid. Uh, so getting out of my shell and getting to interact with some folks that, that, that make me comfortable has been uh, invaluable to me personally. And um, so if all of y'all who know Chastity know what a connector she is and how just amazing she is at building community. And like, that's how I found Bainbridge Black. And for me, it's at once what Darkeem is saying about the things that we have in common, but I'm also so amazed by how diverse we are within our group. All of the different things that folks bring to the table, the experiences that people have had, the places that they've lived, the kind of things that they love to do. Um, and I think that, that that both sense of family and connection, as well as the sense of diversity is what really keeps me coming back to Bainbridge Black. Because there's so many things that I learn each time we get together and the laughter and sharing food and having conversations about all sorts of different things. Um, I, the other thing that feels really important to me about this group is the fact that we are making it in the way that we need to get the kind of healing and support so that we can stay resilient in all the other places that we do our work and live our lives. Um, I think that having an affinity group is just so central to having that sense of joy and resilience and strength to travel through the world. Because, you know, we all know there's all kinds of things that are putting pressure on us in all different directions right now. And I think Bainbridge Black feels to me like a counter narrative to a lot of the stories of that folks want to tell or maybe have been told or have never heard about um, what it means to be Black on Bainbridge. Um, and so I love the fact that we get to come together and decide what that means for us as a group. Um, and also the food is really awesome. All right. Um, well, I think I was also brought in by Chastity um, and very happy. I was, all, I was one of the people I was guilty of, of assuming that the island was mostly white and I had funny nicknames for it like Wonder Bread Island and stuff like that and I don't know that I would ask why would a person of color move here but because it's very it's very welcoming and and stuff but I like the idea of kind of part of the reason that we called it Bainbridge Black was because we're Bainbridge Black as opposed to Seattle Black as opposed to any other place black this there everybody on Bainbridge including not everybody a lot of the people on Bainbridge share a level of privilege that we're wherever we came from however we grew up we now share a, a level of privilege that a lot of other people don't have in it and uh it somewhat sets us apart. So we're, it's a different kind of, we're living a different kind of life and we're, and we're now congregating, you know, as a little side group and, and sharing that and enjoying that. And, but also trying to represent it. Like, so we're, we're trying to get out there and go like, hey, no, we live here. Or we don't see somebody in TNT and go, hey, how long have you been here? Or where are you from? Well, here, I've been here for like a decade or two. So it, we're kind of like congregating as a group, but in a way that, that we represent Black people, but we also represent this place and we're from here and stuff like that. So 
uh, that's what really, really excites me about this group is us doing that and reaching out and sharing it and bringing people in and spreading it around. Um, I'm just gonna add on this call is a very special um, member of Bainbridge Black, um, council lady person, awesome Brenda. Um, and I would love for her to share just how we got our name. <laughs> Yeah, well, hi, everybody. Um, I, I thought I'd kind of like just drop in and, and go unnoticed. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I, I remember you know, a long time ago, and I say I've been here like 15 years, so a long time ago, um, I, I kept running into Black people. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, the first person I ran into was Nikki. Everybody knows Nikki. And I thought, well, let's get together and have a women of color dinner. And my husband, who was white, just laughed. He thought that was so funny. And there was four of us there. And we had a really good time. And we started meeting every month. So the idea that, that I needed community, you know, it goes way back. And, and I think it, it, it's actually the way that we're all raised. Everybody needs community. When we first got together at, at the pizza place and we were talking, um, there, was, there was a lot of joy in us being together. And I felt an enormous amount of support from all of you. And the second time we met, we, we started thinking about this as a real thing, you know? And, you know, we, we didn't want to um, offend anybody and become radical, you know, and, but in the same sense, you know, I had to make the statement, we are who we are. <laughs> we are black people and we live on Bainbridge. So let's just go with that. I mean, that's our name. We, we thought about the Bainbridge black leadership group, but you know, we felt kind of weird about that. And, and this is just, you know, it's not meant to be an affront to anything. It is exactly what it is. We are a group of people who are supporting one another and enjoying that support. And it, and it is, I, I, I loved what was said. It is, there is a level of privilege. When I first moved here and was working for Nordstrom, they told me, you don't wanna move South when you look for a house. Just whatever you do, don't go South. And, you know, so when I did move on Bainbridge, the first thing they said was, well, that's really uppity. Why? <laughs> Why did you want to move to Bainbridge? You know, they're all, they got their nose up in the, in the, in the sky and they actually started treating me different <laughs> because I lived here, you know, and, and, you know, we do get that because we live here. We get it from all over. Bainbridge is its own special place. And with that comes its reputation, whether that's, you know, whatever, political, whatever it is, there is a level of reputation that goes with Bainbridge. And so, um, just so you know, Rennie, now that you've gone skiing, I feel there might be hope for me. I've never gone skiing because I've always felt out of place with all the white snow, all the white people, all of this, all that. I don't know anything about it. When I fall, everybody's gonna laugh. But now that you've done it and you always do it, you know, I didn't know that those type of black people either. <laughs> So, but now I feel like I can go skiing with you because we're all in the same group. Okay, well, we won't tell you what happened on that ski trip. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but yes, I highly recommend it. And, and I will go back. <laughs> Maybe you'll go with me next time. <laughs> Thank you, Councilwoman Brenda, lady, baller, person, awesome. I'm adding things to your title. That are not on your city council tag. Um, and uh, for those of you that saw the um, our name, Bainbridge Black, that's really how it came about, is that people would say, oh, you're from Bremerton? Oh, you're from Seattle? And Brenda so sharply and quickly would turn and go, I'm Bainbridge Black. And it just stuck. Um, Dexter and uh, many of our other uh, members said, it felt right. And for those of you that, you know, when we're using words like black and white and you see it capitalized, understand that it's different from us 
uh, capitalizing the word white, for example, it means a shared sense of community and experience. That's why we capitalize that B. And uh, for those of you that may be new to that, um, it's because we can walk into a room and have the shared experience with any group of African-Americans in America right now, and we would have a similar experience. That's why we use the capital B. Katie, do you want me to share those, those now? Yeah, that'd be great. Jeff has some, some uh, screen sharing she's going to do a couple slides to take us through and uh bambers black folks uh there and in the in the peanut gallery and i see you isaiah hey um sorry i saw young people there so um please feel free to chime in on the on the pictures the logo was designed by one of our members um i love the logo Recognizing the colors, the gold, the red and the green, the feminine, the male, that does not discount the fact that um, we understand that binary and non-masculine other forms exist and to understand that all are welcome. Did I get that right, Dr. D? Got to check in with Dr. D on that. Um, we. We give honors to our elders, the custodial custodian for Bainbridge Island for African-American history have been Akuye Karen Vargas and also for me has been Barbara Golden um, and then many other stories that I have. I don't remember all of the elders names who have talked about the history of Bainbridge Island, but know that the footprint of African-Americans go back to the early 1900s from the cannery to the military to historical folks who've come here by event or um, by mission. Um, were a part of the Bainbridge history, but may not be represented in but a few pictures because caring, amazing people like Karen Vargas made sure that the stories are getting told now. Much like the Indipino, much like um, the stories on the island, it's always been multicultural. It just depends on who's telling the story. So I'm grateful to the Bainbridge Island Historical Museum, grateful to Katie and John, but mostly grateful to Akuya Vargas and to Barbara Golden and people uh, Robin Hunt in my life, Gina Corpaz, people who continue to tell me stories about the history. Um, Rennie, this from our, is this our first brunch? Uh, no, this is from our, uh, well, I think the third brunch, or maybe it was the second, it was second or third. I'm not sure which one it is. I don't want to tell you guys all funny stories, but funny story. Um, this is where Ashley Matthews home and her neighbors came out and thought something was all her family had arrived because he'd never seen so many black people on the beach uh, down on South uh, Fort Ward. Point White, wherever we were. I don't remember where we were. <laughs> um, Todd, do you want to explain what we're doing here? Do you remember? No, I don't remember. What was this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this was um, this was uh, just before campaign, uh, before the uh, election, and uh, one of the things we wanted to do as a group uh, was just to talk to all the candidates and find out, you know, where they stood and what they stood for and what they represented. And so we invited uh, all of the candidates to spend a few minutes with us, uh, chatting. And so that is, uh, that is what you're seeing. And uh, at least one of these occasions, uh, what you're seeing is me in the van pool on the way home from, from the UW uh, during the commute, um, you know, tuning in. So that is what this picture is. It's us talking with uh, candidates. Um, and I will say that probably out of all the candidates, probably half of them, when we got on screen on a Zoom call and we opened our screens, the first thing each candidate said is, I didn't know there was this many African-Americans on the island. We've grown. Many of us belong to biracial, multiracial families. And um, 
it's a unique experience for us because many of us love folks that don't look like us. So it's, it's unique to the island. Some of us are single. Now we're getting these young people attracted to the group and it's really exciting. Um, they're so young. Um, and they are adding to the, the cultural value of the island in a way that is making it so we blend. Look at all those beautiful faces. Um, and almost as important, our meeting and spending time and sharing has been watching our leaders also get elected as the first African-American female. And I want to tell you, I'm not going to try to call her out because I already called her out and she had a talk on the thing, but how important it is for our young people to see representation and leadership, uh, how important it is to see Professor uh, Deanna, how important it is to see Ashley Matthews, how important it is to see Brenda, um, how important it is to walk into a salon and see a CEO slash everything Todd. Um, it's, it's uniquely important on Bainbridge. We have an opportunity to launch students in a very diverse uh, way so that they have these experiences to leave this island for white students too, and know that they're going into a global place that has leaders that, that may not look like them. And it's really important. And um, so it's been an exciting year. And um, she's one of the reasons why we have our name. So, Fabulous. Um, please interrupt me, uh, anybody that has something in their hearts that want to jump, jump out. I, um, I was thinking uh, of Darkeem, you were talking about um, the experience of a fishbowl, and I just didn't know if that was something that you wanted to share a little bit about. Sorry, I was I was muted. Uh, yeah, I was I was joking about that. But the, my mom used to say, uh, she used to call it, you know, you you look like a raisin on a coconut cake, and uh, it, it it's somewhat true, you know, on on the island. And you know, and again, uh, when I when I met all these fine folks, I I, I was in awe uh, because I had seen uh, uh, us in bulk uh, here on the island. And and but but there have been times uh, I've been out and about with my kids. Uh, my daughter's name's Justice and Isaiah, who was uh, here, where where we felt like we were uh, fish in a fishbowl, where people are walking by and and uh, staring into a uh, fishbowl to look and see who we are, what we we're up to, and, and and how we ended up here. Uh, I, I the last time we spoke, I gave you the example of uh, my my kids and I went to Safeway, and there was a guy staring at us extremely awkwardly. Uh, I, I promise that I'm not exaggerating, and by to the point where my daughter. Uh, Justice hid behind a, a car to laugh because it was so uncomfortable. And finally, this gentleman that was staring at me approached me and uh, he, he said, do you swim? And I said, I don't know where the question came from. It was just the most random thing. And I said, yes and no. I don't, I don't understand why you're asking me. He says, I, 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 just, I just thought you could, you could swim. And uh, mind you, my daughter... Uh, she has no game face and she struggles with uh, <laughs> speaking her mind. So she uh, she just hit by the car and started laughing. And I just said, no, I, I, I promise you, if, if you if you think you see me at a pool here, you have it. Uh, but uh, I, I don't understand the question. I, I pretty much uh, said goodbye. So we use that. And my, my kids and I, my, my daughter and I, and, and, and my son, we've mentioned it feeling like at times like fish in a fishbowl where we're part of an aquarium and on display. Uh, when we're being stared at. Thankfully, you know, that's a little lighthearted moment. I haven't had major issues. Uh, for the most part, Bainbridge has been uh, uh, welcoming. Uh, my kids have had some issues with being, you know, the only black or brown uh, of folks in class, uh, specifically my daughter having her, her hair played with. I know every black woman in here could probably tell you that that's very annoying and she made that clear. Uh, folks asking my son if his dad's a drug dealer, how do you, how does he, how is he allowed to, I mean, how does he have money to live on this island? Uh, these are some of the things my kids bring up. Thankfully, they're strong, and I'm, I'm going out of my way to raise them uh, to be strong and, and to brush those kind of things off. But I, I, I do understand that 
despite the fact that we are here, uh, th there is something to be said for the fact that we're still, there's still not many of us on this island. And with that comes a, a, a certain level of curiosity, I should say, about us, which is, uh, uh, which is fine and, and acceptable. Uh, and I, I understand, and I, I, I see it as an opportunity to educate folks that yes, we are here, uh, we are in bulk, we are professional, uh, we have a councilwoman, we have a, a, a Dr. Day, uh, we've got a guy here that owns his own uh, salon, we've got a high that's a leader in hum human resources. Uh, we're, we're not just here because we, we were given something. These are all accomplished folks uh, that, have had a, that have risen through the ranks, so to speak, in, in, in their lives. And so uh, being a fish on a fi in a fishbowl, it can be intimidating and embarrassing and lead to some awkward moments. But it is also an opportunity to uh, educate the folks uh, on this island to the fact that we too can be professional, we too I uh, have accomplished a lot in life and you are not going to get rid of us. <laughs> We're always going to be around. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, let's see, Chastity, did you see a question from Peggy? Um, yeah, yes. um, and I love, Marsha, what you just said about disability and the hyper visible and invisible. Um, I always bring this up on panels, but uh, you know, there's coding and I, I am so grateful to this group because when I'm with them, I don't have the need to code. And for those of you that may not know what that means, that means you become hyper vigilant about how you act or what you say or the words you say. And so you don't have that letdown moment that you are just you, like you are, you're not on edge wondering how someone's gonna take what you say because there's amount of grace and belonging. That's the word belonging. I can go into a friendly group in Bainbridge anywhere, but it may not have the sense of belonging. And I think that hopefully answers what does it mean to be Black? I don't, I'm still Black. And of course, people are very kind to me and my family, but I may not have that sense of belonging. And whether it looks like it on my face or in my body, there's a level of um, discomfort and vulnerability. And I may not show that unless I feel that sense of belonging and can let down with someone, you know, because we have ancestors that fought, that, that everywhere they went, they fought, everywhere they go, they protest, everywhere they go. And not everybody wants to do that 24 hours, seven days a week. Like we got to get lattes, we got to go get toilet paper, we got to go. And it can't be all the time. Um, it's exhausting. And part of healing, I think, for African American folks is to exist and love and to elevate joy and to elevate peace and all those things and not always be lifting and teaching and educating like come on like we need breaks <laughs> like i want to go get a latte i don't want to educate you about racism in between my hazelnut latte and my scone there are days when when todd will tell you about your hair but some of us still have to travel off island to get our hair products and there's still a level it's it's hard to be here on the island right and i so what it means to be black is to have a sense of belonging and still be dipped into my ancestry, still be dipped into what it means to be part of me and our ancestors and elders like Akuye, but to, to have that healing continually by building that sense of belonging. We contributed to the Martin Luther King Inspiration Award and um, this group contributed to that award for the BHS student. And it feels good to give back to the com community and contribute because you see on the screen, these are all teachers. Rennie's a teacher. Todd teaches people every day. Councilwoman Brenda's teaching every day. Darkeem is teaching every day. There's a double lift for African-Americans in the community on our regular jobs. Our regular jobs, then you lift the other stuff on top of it. So we're tired. Can I say on that note, um, today I had something really exciting happened, but it was so heavy that, um, you know, I was talking to my husband who's out of town and he said, you know, you just need to stop and relax. Can you just stop? Because I was like in between meetings and work and trying to meet people. And he said, do you remember you took me to the labyrinth? Why don't you go over there <laughs> and sit on that swing and tell me if you can find the ugly tree? And I'm like, 
he's in Detroit and he's, he's given me all of this that I need, you know, for me to just stop and just put it all aside. And then he says, well, cause you know, I'm, I'm going to Cancun, Mexico, which is really good. He says, I'm glad you're going, but will you be able to stop? <laughs> cause I've already got meetings scheduled while I'm there. And so I go over to the labyrinth and, you know, cause I don't want to um, prove him wrong that I can't stop and I can't sit down and I can't relax. And, you know, 10 minutes there, I'm thinking, I got to leave. I got to go. I got this other meeting I got to get to. But the time that I was there, it gave me enough time to sit. And I didn't find the ugly tree. But, you know, just the idea that there was nobody asking me any questions. There was no answers that I needed to provide to people. That I was just there. And I could feel my heart. You know, and it's it's when Chaz talks about community and what it means to be black for so long, I've had to code to be something different that last weekend when I got my hair done and that's how we say it, we get our hair did. That's what we do. I got my hair done and I'm in the salon and we're laughing. Oh, it's, it's a joy to behold because I, I took my daughter with me and we don't have that kind of camaraderie anywhere. You know, I was full let down. We, I was only Brenda and I was only another person in the salon and we're laughing at all the movie stars and their silliness. And, you know, I drop in all of this slang that I, I thought I forgot, but you can't forget cause it's internal, you know, and we're talking about macaroni and cheese and ham hocks and how you know, that food is now a delicacy and it wasn't before and how you can't, you can't find no chitlins anywhere. And, you know, and those are just the kind of things that makes me proud that I have a, a black history. You know, we talk about black history, but we all have a black history that, that we would, we love to tell each other about because it keeps the stories going, you know, and um, that's, that's every community is nothing but a bunch of storytelling. Um, so I just had to throw that in there. Well, if I can add to that, um, I think when I opened a business on Bainbridge, I was hoping to start a little place like that. Cause I had pictured barbershops like, uh, from childhood or from whenever, but I had gone to a place in Seattle and, and my experience there was what I kind of was hoping people would experience I was somewhat hoping people would experience when they come into Firefly and I went into this barbershop and I sat down and everybody's chatting and they're like hey and I mean this experience could have been made into a movie it, it was like I walk in there and I they're like oh hey how's it going chatting and blah, blah blah some guy comes in and he's like hey I just got a job as a chef at the barbecue joint up the street, I want y'all to come and take these rooms. This is a platter. This person, but while I was coming in for a haircut, this person brings in a platter of barbecue. And it's like, everybody try my sauce. I made this new recipe, test it out. And all, all this stuff's going on. They're having, they're having theological debates and debates about sports and everybody's talking. And I just, I did. I walked into that strange place in somewhere in Seattle and was just accepted in the group. And in the second hour of me being there, the owner of the barbershop looks at me and goes, brother, do you need a haircut? And I go, yeah, that's why I'm here, but keep going. Like, and, it, and it was, yeah, that was just a, a wonderful and fun experience. And I did eventually get a haircut, but um, yeah, I was hoping to like have experiences like that in, in the place that I work. And so when I came into Bainbridge Black, I was all, excited about it and recently during the pandemic there's been well, well this movement seemed to start again or, or at least get like a lot of fuel with the black lives matter and, and etc and all these things are happening there's there's protests in seattle and la 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 and then as chastity was saying like people are tired like um as i'm a hairdresser i'm on from nine to five like three days a week but <laughs> other than that when I see people, they, that's what they ask me. They ask me about what I, 
would I know? And if they know me, then that's what they, oh, hey, what can I do for them? What sort of product should I buy? So I could be at a party, I could be at theater, I could be doing something that ain't doing hair and then I get these questions. And I, I personally, are, are, I'm not exhausted by it, but I understand that feeling. And so when you walk around a place and you look like something, and then people always want to ask you about it, it's exhausting. So there is a big, um, for me, like I would see on social media, people going, hey, just because I look this way doesn't mean I'm supposed to tell you, you're right, it's your job to go figure this out. And I'm like, well, we all can't say that all the time. Like you can definitely, we can say when we don't have the capacity to share that with you. But as a collective, Bainbridge Black, I feel like I love, I'm very happy to be in a place that people might reach out to and ask these sorts of questions because I'm absolutely happy to answer. And I do 100% think it's our job. Like if I refer them to a book and then I think that maybe if the author decided to put their pen down and be like, it's not my job to tell people this then we wouldn't have anywhere to refer people to. So I'm very happy to be, or hopefully maybe become one of the places that people get referred to, to whatever they're, knowledge they seek about our experience or whatever it is um yeah I, i'm excited <laughs> just thought i'd share that and then to piggyback on that todd it actually is my job <laughs> like that's, that's that's a big part of what i do and um what Chas does as well uh with with mac um part of the work that i do is um advancing our goals at Islandwood around justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And the work that we do um, is directly intertwined in the science education and the environmental education that we're doing. Um, we don't see them as separate things because the work that we're gonna do to change and to, and to change our planet and to change our relationship with our planet is deeply relational work. It is gonna take all of us and it's gonna take us working together towards shared goals. But we can't get to that sense of shared goals until we're able to actually have conversations with each other. And the way that Todd was talking about, like we need to be able to know who we are, know where we're coming from, and then determine where we wanna go next. And we all have different things that we're bringing to the table. We all have different goals. We all have slightly different things, but we need to be able to be in relationship with each other um, in order to get those things done. My students come to me often with a lot of passion to change the world. And they are young people and I don't want to squash that, but I also feel it's so important for them to understand that they are one person. And I see burnout in their future if they try to take on everything by themselves. And so I try to talk to them about the fact that, you know, where we are, if you think of yourself in the middle of the bullseye, right, the next circle out is your sphere of control. The things that you can directly impact, the decisions that you make, um, who you're in relationship with, those types of things. And then the circle beyond that is your sphere of influence. And I think the world changes when our spheres of influence and control intersect with other people's. That's when we really start to see movement. That's when we start to see those relationships that can get us to where we wanna go. But we have to start with ourselves and we have to think about how we're positioned to do this work. And where I am positioned to do the work is different from where Todd's positioned and where Brenda's positioned and where Chaz is positioned and Katie and Darkeem and Rennie, right? We're all in different relationships to the work. But if we are in relationship with each other, we're going to have, we're gonna be so much stronger and we're gonna be able to move forward and make the kind of change that we want to see. So I'm with Todd, come ask me questions. Sometimes I'll tell you, not today, and that's okay too. But most of the time I'll say, okay, cool. And because I'm that person, I'm probably also going to say, and have you read this book? And did you listen to this podcast? And, you know, so don't ask an academic unless you want a whole bunch of citations. <laughs> John's laughing. Don't ask a librarian either, huh? <laughs> so uh, I just want to take the, uh, a moment here to explain something that, um, uh, that I 
I've recently thought about uh, with respect to some comments that I've heard. Um, I'm also a member of the uh, Race Equity Advisory Committee here on Bainbridge Island. And, um, you know, recently someone said, you know, that there is no structural racism here on the island. Um, and uh, what I want to tell people is this. Um, uh, the, the, the metaphor that I, I like to use for this is someone who is in a race. You're running, you're training, you're working hard. Really, you're working hard, you're sweating. Race day comes and off you go. You, except you've got the wind at your back. And if anybody has ever walked, uh, walked or ran, you know when you, you're walking with the wind and when you turn around and come back home, you know what it feels like to walk against the wind. The people walking with the wind, unless you're actually uh, co cognizant of it, you don't even know it's at your back. You have no idea. Are you working hard? Yes. Are you sweating? Yes, you are. But you got the wind at your back. And other people who do not have the wind at their backs, they're walking against the wind. And for those who want to say, I'm not experiencing it, so and I can't see it, and so it must not exist, uh, understand you've had the wind at your back and just because you can't feel it doesn't mean that there are others who constantly have that wind in their face and so for anybody that's listening on the island if you think it isn't happening because you haven't seen it you haven't felt it ask yourself do you feel the wind at your back when you're walking with the wind and you know that is uh, i think something that I'm, I'm hoping that people will help people understand that uh, it's not a made up thing. <laughs> it really is there. And we got a lot of work to do, so. I'm, I'm gonna piggyback on what Rennie said because, um, and I'm gonna share with you uh, artwork that we awarded the Martin Luther King Inspiration Award for because I think student art is amazing. And apparently you're gonna see Brenda because she's cute. So, oh well. Um, can everybody see that, pic pic that picture? of the okay this was done by chloe lytle at bainbridge high school and she was awarded um the mlk inspiration creativity award and was also given um an award from by jack um and we also honored frank kitamoto in another award so um but the reason i'm showing you this is because i i too have been confronted by some people who said you know what Chaz, um we don't really believe in racism and i was like that's awesome i mean you don't even believe in it um, we believe everyone's one and it's just, uh, you know, an understanding, yet they're in a different body, they're in a white body. And, and when white bodies comment on um, this can't be, like this racism isn't can be, and, and give me examples of all the trauma that you've experienced. Um, I don't necessarily answer those questions because I don't want to be doom scrolled. So I will say, go get some history um, before I answer those questions because it, it shouldn't be up to BIPOC students or BIPOC folks to prove our doom or prove that trauma. Um, it puts us in a really interesting place. And so we're starting to elevate the conversation and say, um, it's not on us to educate folks about that trauma. Okay, if, I, if Todd wants to share, or Dr. D wants to share, or anyone wants to share, bless their hearts. Um, and then to prove, to double down on their resistance to equity, I won't prove trauma. And I don't want students to have to prove their trauma to indicate something that is, that is um, we're becoming more racially literate. We have a lot more people who have read the book and be, can be counted on to step up into those conversations. Um, but this young lady um, didn't know very much. I mean, she does know a little bit about racial, but as she put together this piece, her understanding came from as she put together the piece. And by the end of the piece, the reason I'm showing you this is she said, I understood more as I was putting together the words he is despised and rejected by his brothers. The art of protest and freedom, the flowers, what it feels like to be in a storm, the promise of a democracy being in America. And there are some people that won't have the lived experience because they don't have relationship with another person, an African-American or someone from a different culture. But our students need that and people on the island need that. I mean, we're a lovely people, but you do need diverse narratives in your life to expand you so that you are literate. And so. Um, I thought this piece just, it showed that you don't have to know everything. People don't have to, you don't have to know everything, but you can become into relationship. And it's part of the reason why we want the island to have more diversity, why we want new young families to move here and why we want that. We want that for the island. We want that for the health of our community. Um, yeah. 
Well, now it is my role to say that we're two minutes till eight. And I just wanted to tell folks that um, our generous uh, panelists have said, hey, if people want to go on beyond eight and there's some chatting that you want to do or some questions you want to ask, that would be um, fine to do. And um, so I'd like to um, wrap up and I can't wait to listen to this again because these words have been so fantastic and so generous and um, really thought provoking. And um, I just, I'm like, so I feel like I do have this um, sense of the earth when I'm on Bainbridge somehow a connection and I feel like you know this is so natural here you know to have this group and I'm just kind of thankful just grateful and um, what a pleasure an honor a pleasure um, to meet each each of you I'm so glad to um, uh, to know many of you and so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask folks if you can just to take it like I just feel like this deserves getting your video uh, and showing your appreciation for the group and saying thank you and then um, we're going to stop the recording and continue. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> That's great. Yay. I'm in the chat. I'm so excited we have BB here. <laughs> so, thanks, everybody. That was amazing. I mean, really, thank you. I just feel so it's interesting from being from on the in the historical museum there's a uh, history evolves and all of that kind of stuff but there is something so sweet about kind of a first of um, you know a public gathering that honors your group and I'm so honored to be here so thank you thank you thanks everybody <laughs> I'm so glad you guys have that group. It just makes me so happy for you. <laughs> Thanks, Brenda. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Thanks, John. Thanks, Katie. You're welcome, Peggy. Thanks for being here. Thank you for hosting, Katie. <laughs> Thank you for being our fearless leader, pulling the panel together. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Thank you. you see, yeah, they're young and multiracial, and they don't have to live on the island. They're working on the island. Um, just send them our way. Um, we would love to connect with them and get them, especially those who moved here during COVID and may not, um, may not be connected with folks. Um, we would love to connect with them and give them a sense of belonging too. Um, these young folks are out here decolonizing. So some of them that aren't involved in church, they aren't involved in, you know, this new breed is different. I'm just saying y'all. And I hope we will see y'all on Sunday at 10 at BEMA for the March and the film since I've been down and the talk with the um, filmmaker, uh, uh, Dr. Gilda Shepherd and uh, Tara Simmons. So please come out on Sunday for Black History event, community Black History events. What time does the movie start, Peggy? The movie starts 11? at 11 at um, Bainbridge Cinemas. But the March starts at 10 at BEMA. BEMA, right. right. Thank you. And then there's also uh, an online community or um, presentation starting at 2.30 online, so. Yeah. Thank you. 
Thanks, Peggy. Yeah, so much love and focus have been, has been put into that. <laughs> I'm going to miss um, Sunday. I'm really sorry. Our grandkids up north um, need someone to watch them. There are some um, other oh. grandparents, <laughs> are, and so I'm sorry to miss it. But I am going to go to, tomorrow down to Bremerton where the post office is being uh, renamed for um, So um, mm -hmm. represent the island down there. <laughs> Great, thank you, Robin, that's great. And you can watch the film uh, virtually. There's a link out there to, um, to just go in and watch it on Vimeo. So I hope uh, if you can't make it in person that you'll take the time to watch since I've been down because it's pretty moving about the criminal justice system here in Washington State. Can I just shout out to Lillian? She is um, our uh, historical museum staff member and expert in our collections and uh, is leading us in uh, much of the decolonization work that we need to be um, doing in the historical museum. And so I just want to hold her up and, and um, if you want to stop by and meet her she's there basically every day she works um all the time but um i just feel like i want to give her a lot of support being in our community too <laughs> any other questions from people Thank you, Chastity, for having those slides. That was great. <laughs> we gonna dance now? <laughs> no, I am not. <laughs> so right now. No. <laughs> yeah, some, of you, some of you know that I am in the certification class to teach Umfundalai or African dance. But no, no. Bloody feet. Call it bloody feet right now. Mm -hmm. I love that. Sunday the quiet like stare at you. Yes. Yes. And I really like the Katie behind you. And I'm I am super grateful for the group. And I am going to um oh yes, Barb Normandy. Thank you, Robin. I know there were some other names in there that I didn't remember. Um, you know, lots of that's names. What, yeah, well, that's okay. This is, you know, exactly we need to um Speak the names, speak the names. And um, we were talking about the, uh, cultural, the cultural creative district that's coming for Bainbridge, like Arts Week and Arts Walk. And um, they always stick me in a group to remind them about uh, black folk stuff and being inclusive in history. And, you know, just put in, put into your head what it would look like if Bainbridge had a cultural heritage center where we had um, components of all of the histories of different folks on the island and what that would look like because uh, I know that's something Akuya has been wanting for years, but it occurs to me that um, we're just now hearing Latino experience. We're hearing from Latino panels. We're hearing they like to get together and have margaritas and play soccer. That's a party. So like we're, we're beginning to see these communities and not all of them are like that. That was a cliche, so forgive me, you all know, um, that to encourage this kind of discussion and having these um, people and having visitors that are diverse and telling stories is really important. And so whatever events that we're doing, are we telling the story? Are we telling, are we telling the stories that need to be told? Um, whether you're doing a legal story or we're doing his, the history, are we doing the, the thing at BIMA, an untold story, are we telling the whole story? And if, and if you're in that room, you be the one to step up and say, is there, is there another story or another perspective, you know? Um, I, I would love to see something like that, Chastity, because each year when our grad students come, because um, they stay for uh, 10 months, and while they're here, we want them to understand this place, this history, to, to know who's here on Bainbridge, who's been here since time immemorial, and what cultural communities have shaped the place while they're, well, where they will be doing their teaching. Um, and it's as important to us that they get that understanding as it is that they start to know the 
plants and trees of the Pacific Northwest. We want them to understand the cultural history of Bainbridge just as much as they understand the natural history. This is a special place and it feels really important to us that um, they have that, that sense. And so thankfully we've been able to work with uh, Katie and the History Museum and we've worked with Bijak and they go visit, visit the Suquamish Museum. And um, Chastity came and talked to last year's class and these, this grounding in our multicultural island is really important to the work that they are gonna be doing as um, graduate student instructors um, at Islandwood. And we sort of, we feel how important it is. And each year it's new because we have a new group of students and they need, we need to find ways to introduce them to it again and, um, and connect them to what this island represents. And, and we do have conservative, not conservative, I wanna use the word closely. We have folks who would like to tell one story of Bainbridge. And what I would say is um, we're the living proof of all the other stories and we still have those people. We still have these elders who hold stories in our community. And I'm so grateful to the fact that we have this intergenerational that can tell the stories. This is the time to tell the stories because um, there, there are people getting nervous about stories being told. And uh, when people get like that, it's even more important that we we keep going on the, the commemoration of the Japanese internment, the Indopino story, Latino story, African-American history, um, because it's such a beautiful, Bainbridge is a unique place that it does have that. Like uh, Kuye says, there is Kidnap County. We do have a history of white supremacy, but we also have a history of standing up against them as Robin has shared in panels before. And we need to continue sharing that, the abolitionist side of the stories, we need all of all of the pieces of the abolitionist stories, even now more than ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to piggyback on what you were saying there, Chaz, I think sometimes the fear can come from a place of folks not wanting their kids to carry the sins of the ancestors. And I think that just as important is for them to understand the power and the work of folks who were working as allies and in abolition from the beginning. And those stories are just as important. And I think are really powerful counter narratives to what folks will use to try to silence the conversation. And they'll say things like the kids who are living now didn't do any of those things, why should they have to hear this painful history? And our kids, our communities don't have a choice about whether or not we engage with our history. And I think that when, if we really mean to be in solidarity with one another and we really mean to be in relationship with one another, we have to all face the things that are hard and painful. But there's also joy and resilience and resistance in the stories of all of our communities. And those stories are also going to be silenced if we allow people to talk about what we can and cannot teach. And I think of the future educators that I work with every day and their joy would be so extinguished if they were told what they can and can't teach. And if their existence as educators was reduced to dodging between the raindrops and looking out for the storm that was gonna wash them away if they said the wrong thing or spoke out in the wrong space. And I don't know how we can continue to prepare people to do this work if we're not really preparing people to do the personal work that's necessary to explore how they feel about this. It's hard and it, it, it can feel painful, but there's also joy and resilience and resistance. And we have to tell the full story. That's the only way that we can get to, that, that we can move forward. We have to be able to tell the full story. And, and the story of discomfort, when people do hear about such things, I, I thought discomfort was just a part of everyone's life. You got the discomfort of being told, don't do this in the store. Mm -hmm. the discomfort of when the police pull you over. I thought Better that act right. had 
the warning from dad or mom, if something mm-hmm. happens, where to go in case if they get arrested or you have to go. Like, I thought everyone got that story. And what I'm learning is there is case studies on the island of people who were brought up here who um, didn't have an experience with an African-American or with a, they were side by side with folks, but they didn't have relationships. And so their understanding of the island is, is different. And so they they want to be proven that there's some sort of, um, any sort of racism. And I don't know how I feel about that. I don't, because I don't want to do that work. I don't want to do that work. <laughs> but I, um, but that's, but that's a case study proving that without having those important relationships early on and exposure, this is what happens. Right. It limits your view so bad that you can look at another person's life and go, prove to me with your trauma that it exists, rather than being open to the idea that another person's existence could be different than your own. And so mm-hmm. they're proving it in real time. And as a teacher, I don't, you know, I have empathy for, for, uh, for people who don't know. I don't know how about the malicious weaponized ignorance of um, racial injustice. I'm not sure. I'm just saying it's something I wonder about. So I'm not willing to engage yet in relationships with someone who does that. So if any of you have hints, y'all can reach out to me. But um, that's something that I'm vulnerable about. uh, Because we all have to do that work, right? We step into something. We all do a little bit of work and research. And I would hope that everyone would do that. It's ironic, I would think, for the young people that do get asked that. I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't know what that experience would be like. But a, for a young person that grew up on Cambridge Island, and you don't, it doesn't matter what color you are, you, you're doing pretty well. So for somebody to ask you that, well, it proves the trauma. That moment in itself is the trauma. That's where you're like this. This is it right now. This is the trauma. I don't like right. it's kind of um, it's kind of gaslighting. It's I don't I don't believe you gotta prove that to me. Like, your experience is something that I don't align with and I need you to somehow convince me. And so mm-hmm. yeah, that would be that would be this particular moment right now is traumatic. <laughs> That's what's going on. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I didn't answer. Um, and so there are times when like your kids don't look like you, you know, those kind of interactions that I pause and I'm pretty friendly. I'm pretty chatty, but people will be like, oh, she's snobbish or she doesn't talk, but y'all know me. Uh, <laughs> if I don't talk, it's because I'm, I'm, I'm in a state of like, I don't know. Cause I really don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I think if you ask the students, they really want to know what happened. They yeah, really if, it was, if it was students, I would answer. These are grown, grown, yeah. grown men. Yeah. yeah. I agree, Peggy, for sure. Yeah, I'm thinking a lot about um, what Rennie said about the wind at your back, you know, and that that experience that when you're being supported and uh, the world is working in the way that you fit in it and you're being carried along, uh, how to, um, like where, where can we teach that so that that question never gets asked, right? How, where can we, sh- teach that you just don't have you it's a ridiculous harmful question to ask it's it's just hard um like i said just it, as as hard as it is to feel that wind unless it's a gale force wind then you'll feel it but it, all it just needs to be is you know, a two three mile an hour breeze and it's pushing you you don't feel it and it's really hard to explain to someone how much assist that is because they're feeling their own muscles working hard and they're sweating. And they're basically they're looking around to the rest of us and go, hey, if you just worked a little harder, <laughs> you know, you'd get the same result. Um, and, you know, a, a very simple example um, for people um, is a great scene in um, Remember the Titans. 
um, where they, they, they win their football game, they come out, and they all want to go celebrate. And so the California guy, the long uh, blonde locks, uh, gets them to walk into a restaurant. And the owner, of course, goes berserk and, you know, throws them out. And the California guy looks at his black teammates and says, I didn't know, I didn't know. <laughs> and they yeah. said, we didn't know because you didn't want to know. Mm -hmm. right? And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's, it's really hard to explain to someone who walks into TNC and they're greeted, everybody's friendly and, you know, they, they, every, every, you know, they have a wonderful experience in there. It's hard for them to understand why I might not feel so comfortable when I walk into TMC. Um, it's hard for them to understand why in a small town, in a place that's been on the island for years, I'm never leaving without my receipt. <laughs> you know? Um, and I, I don't know how you explain those kinds of things to people who haven't experienced it either. You weren't there with the you know Bainbridge Island High School uh, a person of color in TNC who gets stopped at the door going out with all the white friends and asked for his receipt mm -hmm. when you know the white friends are all well, teenagers and they're just doing what teenagers do. Um, if you weren't there and you didn't experience that, and for even people that are there, sometimes even though that's happening right in front of their face, they don't see it or they figure mm -hmm. that's just you know well that's that's what you should do. So it's, you know, um, I, I don't know how you get people to, uh, to, to acknowledge or understand that, yeah, no one's saying you didn't work hard. All we're saying is you got the wind at your back. And, you know, for some of us, it's in our face, you know, all the live long day, which is why, as Chad said, Chad says, you're tired. <laughs> you're tired from fighting all the time. Um, you're against that wind. So. I, I don't know, uh, Katie, how we get people mm -hmm. to see that, but it, uh, it'd be great. If, if you figure it out, let me know. <laughs> if I figure it out, I'll let you know. But actually, actually the, the very thing that is people are trying to ban is how we do it. We talk about the history. We talk about the structures because that, that wind, there's a reason that wind is in right. It's not an accident. There's a reason that wind is invisible. There's a reason those systems are so hard to see because that's how they perpetuate themselves. That's how they stick around. People don't want to or get super uncomfortable saying or hearing the phrase white supremacy. It doesn't mean just people burning crosses. It doesn't just mean people wearing um, you know, white sheets. It means a system that privileges certain people and puts the wind at their back and a system that is blowing a gale force wind in other people's faces. And until we're able to have those conversations about the structures that surround all of us, because if you think about, I'm gonna get academic on you, sorry, not sorry. Um, <laughs> if you, List or think about Paulo Freire's work. And he talked about the, he calls the binary, right? The oppressed mm -hmm. and the oppressors. And his major point is, and my, my students read it every year, to understand that both the oppressed and the oppressors are hurt by the system. The system hurts everybody. It seems like some mm -hmm. folks have privilege and some folks have power and that some folks are having an easier time, but everyone's humanity is destroyed in a system where some people's humanity is valued over other people's humanity. Mm -hmm. And that's the conversation that folks are trying to ban. That's the conversation that people don't want to allow to happen because we'd end up with a different type of system. And it's not anybody's fault that they can't envision what that different type of system would look like. It just feels like certain people are gonna lose things. They can't envision that even those folks who might quote unquote lose things are gonna gain something so much more important to all of our humanities. And that's a conversation that is gonna take a longer time to have. Mm -hmm. um, longer than Black History Month. 
<laughs> this is hard. Go I, ahead, Robin. I have one technique that I've used over the past, I don't know, five to 10 years that works with most of the white people in power I've, I've tried it with. And I'm sorry um, to say, yeah, sometimes I will go along with a person of color because the white person in power has um, unwittingly um, discriminated against or mistreated the, the person of color. And the person of color tried to bring it to the white person in power's attention and not really getting anywhere. So sometimes we've gone, I've gone along as sort of a team effort and the approach I've taken, and I guess you can say this is dealing with white fragility, but it does achieve the objective. If you're dealing with a person who really does have a good heart, and I think like Chastity mentioned, to someone that is just totally oblivious to how whatever they said or did came across to the person of color. Um, and you start at it that way, I just go, well, you probably didn't intend this, but when you said this, or when you did this, this is how it felt that to so-and-so. And I've even sometimes, that when it's happened in my presence, um, one time it didn't work very well, and I explained to this longtime white friend, when you said this to my friend Barbara Golden, this is how it hurt me and her, and can we please talk about it? Barbara had told me that once I sent him an email trying to talk about this, she says, you'll never hear from him again, and she was right. So that's one time it didn't work. But most of the time, most of the groups I've tried to work, you do this with, and you have to be willing to risk a friendship, a long friendship, if you bring it up, even when you're trying to be um, careful. But most of the times when I've tried this technique, at least as a white person, with as an ally with a person of color, we have achieved success. These are all quite, no, none of, most of you don't know all the different institutions that, you know, we have approached and changed uh, for the better. And what was wonderful about most of these attempts is that now, or later on, that the person of color that I went with is now, um, has a direct bridge to the white person in power. They are allies. I can just get out of the picture. Um, and I hope that that will continue that I don't, you know, don't, but every once in a while, it just seems like there needs to be a little extra push and I'm uh, just for somebody to listen. And, uh, and if it takes white privilege or whatever you want to call it to, to do that, um, and I'm going to insist and I will risk friendships or whatever it is, uh, because uh, I'm, I'm old, I'm old, I'm an elder now. I'm almost 74. I, I get to say what I think. I, mean, I try to be tactful, but I'm not letting anybody off the hook and I'm pretty direct. As most of you know, <laughs> can be misinterpreted. But uh, anyway, and, and the same has worked with. I've been working with the city of Paulsbo on behalf of the Suquamish Tribal Council. That um, you haven't seen the results of that um, work yet, but you will in the next year. Huge, huge mm -hmm. sea change from where we started. Uh, I promise you, you will see that. But it's just been done in lots of little patient steps knowing that the people have good heart and good intentions, but they just haven't been enlightened yet. And that takes a while. I, I agree with that. I'm having that situation with the public utility district, and I'm trying to hit it with that very same nature. Of, I was having a discussion earlier today that was similar in how I think um, People, well, first of all, if you if you encounter somebody that is vehement that they're not racist, the idea of somebody not yeah. wanting to be considered racist would make you assume that they probably have what we would all consider to be a good heart. <laughs> like, so their <laughs> intentions initially are, must be something that you, you may just have to dig into. But I feel like lately, yeah. well. If I watch some videos from the '60s, it, maybe it's been a long time, but people will reach. Will will when we get defensive, we come up with something that doesn't. It lacks compassion. It lacks. It lacks um, wanting to hear. Uh, so almost like you said, with the invent, inviting the white supremacists there to to say the 
their side of the story. It all, it lacks of us wanting to hear anybody else's side of the story. And it, and they're the same. Other sides are the same. Like we don't. I have this. I believe this, and I'm right. And I don't. And I don't. I don't need to hear whatever you're saying is wrong. And we get into this argument where two people are two people are two sides are right, and they're not. They're not leading with compassion and a willingness to understand. We're coming in with a story that we need you to understand, and that's yeah. I, historically, I'm not a historian, and I really only read cliff notes. But I don't think that's ever worked. So like, <laughs> I don't think it ever ever did a thing. So yeah, no, that that idea of of getting that coming in with compassion, coming in with first wanting to understand where they're coming from, and then saying, this is how that felt. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's gonna be the way that this next phase is one. Yeah, yeah, that's great. It's wonderful. Definitely. Hey, all, thank you for the opportunity to share and all the support. Um, I'm mm -hmm. now working on my. Uh, this is five and a half hours. I've been on Zoom since three o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> so bye -bye. Yeah, I, I did a meeting all the way down. So um, thank you. I'm going to sign off, but thank you. Yeah. Very much. Thank you. <clears throat> if you're ready, have a wonderful night, everybody. Take care, everybody. Bye. Thank you so bye. much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>